He's the front man of the legendary hip-hop group Fushnikens. He's a sick MC, whether in a group or solo. He's helped shape the soundtrack of my life as a 13-year-old kid in Washington Heights. He's Shif Fu, a.k.a. Jungle Rock Jr., and I want to welcome him to the library with Tim Monica. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thanks for having me, man. Thanks for having me. So like always, I like to uh, obviously start from the beginning. Uh, okay. Um, when you were growing up, what was kind of the soundtrack being played in your household? Uh, the soundtrack in my household was kind of crazy because I'm um, West Indian. Um, so I heard soca, reggae, and hip hop mixed. And it, it was just that with some other a, a cornucopia of other sounds also. But that was just like the backdrop in my house. Saturday mornings, you wake up, you're hearing reggae music. You understand what I'm saying? And after the reggae music died out, then it was soca, and then my brother would just come and just be reckless with the hip hop music for the rest of the night. You know, what was it about? I, you know, you're you listen to your discography, and you're able to mm -hmm. rhyme straight. You're able to, you know, sound reggae. reggae. Mm -hmm. um, what was it about? Why not go on the reggae path versus like why'd you go on a, the hip hop path? This is something I never told anybody. Um, when I first started out, I wasn't emceeing at all. Um, <clears throat> I was strictly doing reggae. And then I was, I went into a friend of mine's basement. His name was um, Wallstein Chapman. And I picked up Shinehead's album. I think it was um, some Concrete University or some Sidewalk, Sidewalk University. And I played the album. And when I played the album, he was doing both. So I said to myself, I, I wanted to do both and master both. I don't want to be an MC that walks on stage and just can't do anything else. You know, I, I just feel that if someone throws on hip hop beats and you're just stuck doing that, then that's just that. I just wanted to to do more. So I, I you know, I got more into hip hop and yeah, it just shaped my sound, being able to do both. You know what I mean? It, just borrowing from each other because, you know, hip hop and reggae more so are, are like cousins in a sense. So it, it was fun for me. Why? I guess why? 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 Why music being your path? No, music being my path. I don't play sports, bro. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I don't play sports, man. Um, I wasn't that kid that was really into like the sports and all the other things. And I think I gravitated to music because that's all I heard in my house. So I was able to play the ten of steel pan growing up as a kid. So it shaped my ear real weird. So when I heard music, I'm hearing that within music. So, mm. um, and plus I was sickly when I was young, born without any floating ribs, ambilichial hernia, heart murmur, you know what I'm saying? And I had leg braces. So I wasn't thinking of sports. So the only thing I could do was just sit and I was just listening to this, uh, this black radio that my father had brought me at the time. So I just started mimicking everything that I was hearing and I got incredible at it and just started writing from there. So I was one of those weird kids that like at 11 years old, I was kind of dangerous. Then, you know, people were just like, yeah, he's, he's a little bit, you know, too much, you know, lyrically. But at around 11 is when I knew, I, I want to say around 11 is when my brother knew because he used to bring a lot of ska music from England and I started mimicking the ska patterns and cadences. And from then he knew that, you know, I had something special going on. So when do you start <clears throat> your writing? When do you start, I guess, sharing publicly? Writing? Um, I was writing from when I was nine. I was writing from when I was nine. I was mimicking my brother because he was an MC, And at that point in time is when I, I, I knew that I had something. You know what I mean? So the writing began began at nine, and I, I haven't stopped since. You know what I mean? So, yeah, <laughs> to answer that question. You say you're. It's interesting. You you you're. You say you're mimicking your brother. You're mm -hmm. um, you're obviously from a different school where, and it's not throwing shade at today's MC, but mm -hmm. uh, or beat maker, so to say. But right. everyone sounds the same, mm -hmm. and it's not to be like because I'm 39, old dude. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I think it's legit. Um, right. You come from a school that you know you have to be different. Yes. Um, I feel like as I'm the younger, youngest of mm -hmm. three total boys, uh, it's easy to just like mimic your older brother and mm -hmm. not 
feel like not feel like you could change what they're doing. Right. How did you know that you had to be different in this music? I think when we came out, before we came out, you had De La Soul and Tribe Called Quest, and there was this new energy in hip hop where everybody felt like they had to stand alone by themselves, but still be amongst people. And everybody had their own sound, you know. So I said if I was gonna, you know, <clears throat> do music or get into the music industry, I wanted to make sure that I had my my own sound and I didn't want to sound like anybody else. So that's why when it came to different cadences and different flows and styles that I would introduce and, you know, rhyming backwards and forwards and doing all these other things and tripling up on lyrics and stuff like that. No one was doing that at the time. So I figured that, you know, with the name itself, Fushnikins, and the styles that I had mastered, I, f I figured that we would stand out, you know, which we, you know, we did kind of. And, and, and you know, <laughs> things worked, you know what I mean? So it, for me, that was a, a big thing. And then also representing, you know, the West Indian culture, like doing the record Ring the Alarm, where people were able to say, well, um, that's like the first hip hop group to do a dance hall record. Right. You know what I mean? And to have it played on dance hall radio, it was unheard of. And to go <clears throat> and it, and to go gold in Canada wasn't easy for American artists because that was frowned upon at the time. But we went gold in a matter of three weeks there because of the large West Indian base there. So they were just like, well, this is the first time we have somebody that's West Indian that could do both. And he's playing on you know, reggae radio and hip hop radio. So, yeah, I got to embrace that. that was is it, I was going to ask you this later, but mm -hmm. uh, speaking of ring the, ring the, ring the alarm, uh, is there stuff about, from an artistic point of view, is mm -hmm. there stuff that um, reggae, West Indian mm -hmm. uh, music allows you to do or doesn't allow you to do that, mm -hmm. that hip hop does or doesn't allow you to do? That's a good question. <clears throat> that is a very good question. And I can answer it like this. The one thing about reggae music or, um, yeah, let's keep it like that. The one thing about reggae music that you can do and not get frowned upon is you can talk about God in reggae music and nobody frowned upon it. Oh, interesting. Think about that. You, there's, there's, when you uh, go to a reggae party, there's certain parts of reggae that they play in the party. As soon as you go inside there, there's the early juggling music, which might be the early records from the 80s or the 70s or whatever. And then there's a conscious period before they get into the dance hall dance hall. And that conscious period is where you'd hear your Capletons, your Sizzlers, and all those other people that can actually speak about society, God, or whatever, and it, you won't get frowned upon. Mm -hmm. at all. But in hip-hop, you know, the only person that was able to do something like that and get away with it was Kanye. And it's, I'm not saying that it's a, it's, it's, well, I am saying that it is, it is kind of bad that you just can't actually be yourself. You understand what I'm saying? You have to, they have to basically generalize it to a kind of hip hop. Like this is, 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 um, conscious or gospel hip hop. Right. But in reggae music, you can get on stage with a conscious artist, uh, uh, a dancehall artist, a lover's rock artist, all in the same festival and throw on one beat. And they could all say what they want to say in the crowd at just level. So the, so is the, is it frowned upon in hip hop by labels or is it more, I mean, or is it, or is it more cause it's, it's categorized. It's, it's categorized for one. And I think it's, 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 I think when there's borders and things are categorized that it gets kind of corny mm. because you're saying, that is that, and that has to do that, right? Why can't you throw on Impeach the President and have a gospel artist just jump on there um, and rhyme with the likes of several other artists? I, I get that people aren't ready to, to see or hear something like that, actually, but I think that that's the only problem with uh, the difference between hip-hop and reggae, how those things could actually happen and it won't be categorized at all. You... Uh you said something interesting recently. Uh, I think very peace, people, peace, people, what up? very powerful on uh, on Instagram. You posted mm -hmm. about and and you know people say this and they kind of feel like they say it because they they throw it away. Mm -hmm. But you generally you wrote this post about how music really saved your life. Mm -hmm. um,
can you talk about that post and what paths did you see yourself going down if it wasn't for music? You mean the recent post? Yes. Okay, the recent post was like, what, yesterday? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I have two kids. It's very delusional. When, when, what, what day of the week it is for me, yeah. but yes. <laughs> the post that I put up yesterday. Um, for me, I didn't think that I had a voice, right? Because first and foremost, I was the kid that didn't play any sports. Um, when I came outside to play with certain people or, or whatever as a kid, it was only a few people that basically understood, well, he can't play football. He can't do this. He can't do that. Well, all right, we're just going to sit on the steps and we're just going you know, to tell your mama jokes or whatever. Just right. enjoy ourselves. But um, as I got older and, and I was in, um, when I went to high school, I couldn't join certain teams or anything. So the only thing that I was able to do was was join the music class. And after school is when things just went crazy because, you know, now you're, you're running with a different crowd. And I just started doing everything crazy, mimicking my brother. You know what I mean? Because at, at that point in time, that's my superhero, right? Right, yeah, you of know? course, yeah. After, after your brothers, then your father. My brother's my superhero because he's coming home with all these stories, man. And <laughs> I'm like, yo, I want to do the same thing. So I just started wilding out, being in different places where I should not have been and doing things. Sorry, Ma, that I've she probably today would bust out in tears if she knew I did that. But I was doing it because um, I felt there was a need to do it at the time. I didn't want my parents to actually. Um, come out of their pockets anymore to do any more for me, you know, at a young age. That was 13 when I started wilding out. But when I was doing everything that I was doing, I always heard music. And it was mm -hmm. the weirdest thing. I would be in certain places and I'd hear, I'd be sitting there waiting for certain things to happen or certain things to come to, to be moved. And I'm hearing music and I'm just writing on anything I could find. Wow. Yeah. You know, brown paper bag. I'm writing on the back of, um, the, the, the uh, you know, when you buy something from McDonald's and you get your burger and it's in the wrapper, oh, yeah. I'm writing on that. I'm writing on that. So, in a sense, <clears throat> music did save my life because there were certain situations and things people asked me to do that I just couldn't do because of what I started feeling about myself. I was like, yo, I think I could really do this thing. You know what I mean? And they're like, nah, dude. You know, you're making enough money doing what you're doing. And I'm like, nah. Well, my parents didn't come to this country, you know, to 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 raise failures in a sense, you Man. know what I mean? So I figured that, you know, I would try my hand at it. It it changed my life in a sense because um, I started looking at school different because of the writing. I needed more information. So the only way you could get information to write is to go to class. I started going to class. I started writing. I started writing poetry in school. I wasn't, um, I got confidence. I started performing in schools. Uh -huh. I started doing both reggae and both hip hop in schools and winning all these battles and competitions. And that's how it actually saved my life. You know what I mean? And, but the path that I was on was not a good path. It was not a good path. And, and to the point where my brother tried to step in and help me or check me, you know, as an older brother, he was like, nah, you, you worse than me. And I'm like, yeah, but that's what you're thinking at yeah. the time. You got to be, better than your brother but it, it shouldn't have been that you know what i mean so to this day he and i are grateful that i'm grateful that he used to bring home all those scar tapes and those are the tapes that i used to take with me when i used to go and do foolishness <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> just have it in my a walkman you know for those that know what a walkman <laughs> just be playing my sony walkman and just listening to all these ska rhythms and while everything around me is happening i'm just just writing to what I'm hearing. So it really, it shaped my life. Um, I looked at my parents different after that because it, when you're starting to listen to conscious music, then you're understanding a parent's position. And I started feeling bad because of certain things they were telling me and I wasn't paying attention just mm. because I just wanted to be the oddball. But when I started paying attention and understanding how I have to treat them and be thankful that day, they, they did something that I didn't do. They uprooted from a, a, a one country and came to another and just started from scratch, right. you know, just to make sure that we were okay. So I had to look at that and be very, like, super appreciative, you know what I mean, instead of doing all the foolishness. So that's how music really shaped my life. And 
And from that, you know, dealing with my son, dealing with my wife, dealing with, you know, friends around me, you know, it's, it's, it's totally different now. Like if I had the same mindset I had at 13 to 13 to 19, mm -mm. nah, <laughs> I don't know. It, it, it would have been totally different, but I'm just glad that music was there and it saved my life. And yeah, it totally saved my life. Was there a, you know, you, comedians have like comedian, comedian, or like there might be like a local comedian that mm -hmm. uh, you don't know, you know, no one knows about, but you know, but everyone knows about him mm -hmm. if you're a comedian. Mm -hmm. um, for you uh, growing up, was there a, uh, like an MC, MC that you know might be local and never really blew up, but kind of you looked up to. Um, and you talked about your brother. Anyone else? I'm gonna talk about an MC who did blow up, but I don't think he got all the recognition that he did. His name is um, Educated Rapper from UTFO. I lived on 56th Street between Church and Snyder. He lived on 55th Street between Church and Linden. And growing up, they were in a group before the UTFO, and they were called the Jamalot Crew. And they played at all of the block parties in Brooklyn. So I used to see this guy, educated rapper, and he's rhyming. And I was like, yo, he's using these huge words that, you know, <laughs> I'm, getting as, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm getting in school as, as spelling words. Right, you understand right. what I'm saying? But he's using them like it's nothing. And one day he, um, he played for my brother's 16th birthday party in the backyard. And, you know, the Jamalot crew was there. At the time, Ice was part of the Jamalot crew and, you know, along with um, Educated Rapper, but not Kango Kid and everybody else. So he got on the mic and just started rhyming. I'm like, yo, this is the dude that's going around the neighborhood, you know, doing his thing. And at that time, I wrote a happy birthday rhyme for my brother. And I was like, yo, I want to do this happy birthday rhyme for my brother. My brother was just like, nah, nah. <laughs> he said, let him go down the mic and I did this happy birthday rhyme and destroyed this backyard party and he told me at the time educated rapper he was like you know keep it up you're gonna be good at this one day I said okay and then years later I'm holding his album right you know UTFO and I'm like yo that's the guy blah 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 you know that's crazy um but I would have to say educated rapper he was the dude in the neighborhood that really made me uh want to do it because he lived directly around the corner. Right. And I was actually friends with his brother, but didn't know that my boy's brother was educated rapper. You know what I mean? So I wanna I wanna turn to your music. Mm -hmm. Um and I mean particularly the single uh Lashmu, but Lashmu, but not because of, you know, basically not because of represent what it represented mm -hmm. how I mean impactful it was as mm -hmm. a kid growing up, but when you look at the production credit. Mm -hmm. You what what really stands out and it's he's been on the show is the Bob Power uh, studio. Yes. Um, if you could, you're, you're, you're recording at a time where people are forced to go into a studio to record They're, you know, not digital yet. So you actually have sessions where you're taping, mm -hmm. you know, stuff on the board and making sure no one fucks with it at the you know, end of the day. Right. Um, if you could kind of take us into those recording sessions and be like, I mean, what was that like for people that now are, you know, recording in a closet and sending an MP3 to someone else and stuff like that? Wow. I could say wow first. Um, Bob Powers is not from this planet. Um, Bob Powers was not just an engineer. He was also a producer. Because he would hear certain things and tell you to try it. And I'm not the easiest person to actually engineer for or record at that time. It's different now with, you know, everything is, is digital. And, and But back then you're punching in right. or you're splicing tape. But Bob is sitting there saying, okay, here's what we're going to do. He listened to me and he says, all right, I'm going to record you twice. I'm like, what do you mean you're going to record me twice? He said, I'm going to record you twice. And I'm trying to understand what this man is saying, but he was actually talking about two tracks. He says, give me your best and see if you can beat your best. And I give him my best and I'm, then I'm saying, see if I can beat my best. But while, he, while I'm doing all of this, he's actually recording me in places where he thought wasn't audible for people. Mm. Now, that's smart. That's back yeah. then. And he's just like, okay. And he's erasing and cutting. And he said, come in and hear your verse. And I'd listen and I'm like, oh, no, that's very. But he's, he's putting everything together 
because he knows the verse because I said it so many times, but he's just like, all right, I just wanted to make sure certain things were audible. Mm. Now, to to actually have to go into a room and see nothing but reels is crazy because first and foremost, you have, um, let's say, Jive Records. Everybody's four-inch reel, I mean reels, were actually downstairs at Battery because you had to use Battery if you were signed to Jive. So you're stepping inside there, you're seeing KRS, you're seeing Tribe what you seeing all these things and you're standing there going, my God, this is a, a lot of people recording here. Then you start to see Billy Ocean, you know, just people yeah. that you wouldn't even, you know, you're seeing Billy Ocean. Then you're seeing UTFO too, you know, and you're standing there saying, this is not easy because <clears throat> Bob would get there before us and put the tape up and he would constantly be rewinding and playing, rewinding and playing, rewinding and playing. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm warming up the machine. No, I'm not thinking about that. Right. He's warming up the machine. He's like, remember, I, if the if the machine sits, it sits. So I'm warming up the machine. As soon as I come in there, he's he's ready. But he's a different, he's not from here, man. He's not from here. Chip, are you ready? I'm ready for you. Everything was, and he's like, what if, why don't we add an echo here? What did, What else different do you hear? But I'm not hearing anything. I'm just hearing straight lyrics. And he's like, no. Air candy. You got to think about peaks and valleys. He taught us all of this. Peaks and valleys. Where's the thing that you want people to hear you say? What are people going to say with you? You know, these are things that engineers don't normally do. Right. So I'm like, well, is he engineering? What the fuck? You know, like, <laughs> like you know what I'm saying? But but then I had it had to come to a point where I'm just like, that's the only person I wanted to record with. Bob Powers. And, and within that time, no one really wanted to record without Bob because of his input. You know what yeah. I mean? So, and, and, those times it was, it was crazy because sometimes you'd get an uh, an engineer whose cuts weren't too precise. You know what I mean? And you can hear it on the tape because sometimes when people would connect, they connect with a uh, regular tape, and then you'd hear it and be like, "Nah, dude, I heard that in the, in from you know within the track." It was it was crazy. Um, but you had to have that right person, that right engineer that, that loved his art, loved the art form. And wanted you to do good, because there were some people that used to come in there that just wanted to check. Right. And you can tell when you when you listen to a Bob Powers session and their session, or Bob Powers mix and their mix. Bob would mix before you come there. Like he'll say, "All right, I'm I'm going to start mixing your record at three o'clock. I need you there at five. Wow. <laughs> right? So <clears throat> I'm like, "Well, why do you want me to come in at five? He's EQing everything, kick, snare, your voice. So when you walk in, all he's doing is pressing play and you're listening, saying, this is incredible. He's like, no, I want you to look for what's wrong. He's like, this is, I just EQ'd everything for you to hear. Now, what do you hear that's wrong in it? And I'm like, well, you can bring my vocals down, you know. You, you know, my uh, my doubles is too loud. My, you know, uh, doubles is too loud. You can bring down the snare, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, all right, we'll leave the room. The track would be mixed. It's only vocals that he'd be dealing with when we get there. And the track would sound huge. And we're like, dang, I, I want to do my verse over this. <laughs> now you're actually hearing, how, you know, what he can actually do to the track. So big up to Bob, man. That's 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 the alien. Him and um, Skeff. Anselm. Crazy engineers, man. All this Darwin Kennedy, too. And there's a bunch of them. But he was that dude yeah did the writing i, I hear that I, I, does that mean does did the writing process change for you i mean like pre you know i guess i like pre bob powers versus when you're going I, were you writing within in studio at i the never time? wrote in the studio so, i never wrote in the studio because you know <laughs> upbringing you know on this i think i went the first time when i wrote in the studio my father asked me um, when you went to write in the studio, were they charging you? And I said, yes. And he was like, how much were they charging you per hour? I said, $75 per hour. And he said, um, did you finish the song? I said, no. He said, that's a waste of money. Hmm. So I never wrote in the studio again. And I would write at home. And uh, Bob Powers told me to buy a handheld recorder and practice my verses before I came in so my sessions would be short. So yeah. by the time I got there and I'm kicking my verse, I, I knew it by heart, front to back. And he'd say, all right, well, 
give me to, you know, go inside and kick your first. I need your bass and I need and I do it and I'll be done. Uh, uh obviously uh Lash Move was a huge hit. Mm-hmm. Um and all of us could probably recite it today. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is good. Uh and of course it had the late great uh Fife on it. Mm-hmm. Um how did the how did Fife get on it and what kind of was your I mean, what what did you take away from working with Fife? Um, the Fife story goes back before music. Fife, you, Fife and Pac Fu, Fife's mother and Pac Fu's mother grew up in Trinidad. You know, and she, Fife used to come on the block, and he would play football. Now remember. Playing football, right? <laughs> so I'd be on Lennox Steps telling the jokes, which is Pac Fu. I'd be telling the jokes of Pac Fu on the steps, but Fife was also sickly when he was young too. So um he would go and play football and <clears throat> he'd get hurt up a little bit. But then he'd go and sit on the porch. So it would be Lennox and his entire family with Fife in the house across the street from me. And um that's why I knew Malik from. And also from um, from uh, a cousin of mine, Jewel Hudson. They went to the um, the same church, Seventh Day Adventist Church, or whatever. So they, I, I knew him from there too. So it was before music. So then to actually get signed to Jive, and then Lennox sees his childhood friend, like, "Yo, Malik, what's happening?" He's like, "So you here?" He's like, "Yeah, we got signed." So automatically, he was like, "Yo, we got to do a record." No, we got to do a record. Uh, we didn't know what we would do, what, what type of record we were going to do. Fife and I got closer because of the whole uh, parents being from Trinidad, and you know, everybody used to say, "Y'all look alike," and I'm like, "I don't look like Fife." You know, <laughs> sort of me, um, and the closeness grew from there. Um, very competitive person. Very competitive. You know what I mean? That was his thing. Like I'm gonna kick, and he. He's one dude that I think that a lot of people slept on when it came to freestyling. All right. An incredible freestyler. Like, you put him in a room and he'll be there for hours. Hours. Non-stop. And half of the stuff he wrote was off the top. Half of it. Like, he'll come in with a verse that's half done and just say the rest. That's how we did the song with uh, Whitey Don called Article when we recorded it in Long Island. He had half a verse. I had my full verse. I did my verse, and he was just sitting in the corner playing around. And then he just started saying his verse and then just caught and caught that pocket and kept going. And I looked at him. I was like, dang, I need to learn how to do that. And he was like, well, dude, just, you know, stop playing around with words or whatever. But it was um, to finally do the record and get in there. I remember Fife walking in there, and he was kicking his verse to Ali. <laughs> Jive Records said, you know, you guys have been um, taking too long to finish your album. So Ali was like, I'm going to finish the rest of the album. I love their sound. <clears throat> so we had three days to finish uh, the album. We did Lash Move, Truth. We did everything that was produced by Ali Shaheed in three days. So that's, that's Heavenly Father, Lash Move, Truth, Fushne. All that stuff we did in three days three days everything that he produced so we were just sitting there just bringing in certain people all right all right and then fife walks in and was like yo y'all ready and he kicks his verse to ali and he was like well all right, i'm just gonna go in there and do my verse he did his verse we just started yelling and i was like you know i'm gonna do my verse i did my verse and we just was laughing because we were just like wait till when people hear this you know because you know if you really think about it tribe didn't really collab with much people right. at the time. So to, so for a member of Tribe to be like, yeah, I'm going to rock with these guys right here. Everybody just, they everybody gave us that second listen. Like, you know, what is it about them? Whatever, you know what I mean? But it was, it was incredible when it was done. It was incredible when we did the video. Um, and I think for me, you know, when Tribe broke up for the first time and, Fife was touring by himself. I was touring with him. So every night we're doing a lash move, just him and I. You know what I'm saying? So there's nights when we'd sit there and laugh and be like, yo, remember when we recorded that song? And I was like, yeah, I remember you walked in the in room and you had on um, this, you know, this, this um, 
this baseball cap. What color, what color baseball cap was that? He was like, it was a blue and red baseball cap. It was the Chiefs. He remembered what he was wearing. <laughs> the Chiefs, you know, da da da. And I had on these sneakers and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay. But I think because of that record, that record created the bond because um, touring together like that, you know, it, it was easy to segue into his his set. Right. Because I would end with Lash Move and then he'd come out from the back and do his verse and then he went into his set. You know what I mean? So <clears throat> that was this that was powerful for then and powerful before, you know, his, his demise. Like the last time we performed together was um in Canada and he was tired. I think he'd done a, a bunch of shows and he needed water. And he could not perform. But the last thing we did was Lash Move to come into his set. But that was the last time we ever performed that song together. And I was like, wow. You know what I mean? Because when I look back at it now, that really was the last time we actually did the song together. Oh, wow. You know what I mean? We haven't, you know, after that, that was it. We, you know, when we had plans to, to do other things, you know what I mean? But that was the last time we did that song. So, you know, it, it, and hearing the song now, I was like, who who would think that from that day it it you know, we became men and were touring together. Right. You know what I'm saying? Sharing sneaker ideas and how to clean sneakers with with toothpaste and, 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 and rubbing alcohol and all sorts of stuff that people wouldn't even think about, you know what I'm saying? And um to form this bond and friendship over a song and, and just competition, you know, and understanding that, you know, we grew up together. All right. You know, it's not like we didn't know each other. Like we, we, we knew each other, and I, I knew his family. You know what I mean? I knew his mom's was my boy Lennox's good friend, and they would come over, and we'd be there together. But then to get signed and do something like that and be grown men touring, that was that was a big thing, man. That was big. Was there a lyric in that song that kind of you maybe I five that like the first time you heard it, you just got floored? I go, oh shit, that's amazing. Five Dog was never, uh, uh, here we go once again with the ill flow. Other MCs that rap, the style is so, so. Just the, in every intro that Five did to me was the stamp for him. Mm. I think that he got to a point where he wanted people to hear him. So every rhyme, if you could recite from Five, the intro was always a heavy intro. There's some MCs that you can listen to and be like, Mm, but there's that one line yeah. you're always saying and then you really don't remember the rest of the rhyme right but Fife's intro and the heart of his verses always crazy ah uh, that's crazy um I want to turn I mean another a song mm -hmm. obviously that was huge as well was What's Up Doc featuring Shaq as a 14 year old kid hearing that uh and seeing that Caribbean hip hop vibe coming in Shaq is rhyming okay uh, you know, he's a fourteen-year-old, a basketball player is rhyming. Mm -hmm. I always went, how did that happen? Uh, <clears throat> and did you know, or did you? Ex and this is not to be, douche, not put shade on Shaq, but did you expect much from him coming out the gates? Well, see, that's a, another thing too. It's, it goes back to how I was raised. You, you you hear a person's heart. I don't never care what comes out of a person's mouth. Mm. Right. I hear the heart first. What comes out of the person's mouth is what they're thinking and what they're feeling. You know what I mean? So when he said to me that he had his rhyme, I didn't ask him if it was good. I didn't ask him if it was bad. But you got to understand, hearing his heart say that he had his rhyme and that he wanted to record his verse, you knew he was going to give it his best shot. Right. Because at that particular point in time, everybody is talking about him, so you're not going to give you a because that, that, that could have done so much to him in the media. Like, all right, Orlando Magic, you know, it's science and blah, blah, but he's garbage at. You get what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. So I, I guess, you know, just hearing him and him saying, you know, let me kick my verse. And then when he went in there, um, I sat there with him and just a few lines. I just coached him on presence. I said, don't say that like that. Just say it like this. And he listened. And then when he heard it back, that was the first time he heard himself. And he's like, yeah, and I was like, you know, that's actually good. That's not bad. You know, yeah. I've heard worse. So I was like, <laughs> yeah, that's that's actually good, Shaq. That's dope. But a lot of people don't know he was he's you he's a DJ at heart, right? DJ. So back then he was DJing. 
we'd go to his house and he'd be mixing and blending records like it's nothing. So to see him doing these Shaq Diesel concerts and all this stuff and he's playing records and mixing, that's something I knew for a long time ago that he was able to do, you know, without any hiccups. You know what I mean? But MCing, he took the time. He put in, he put enough time into that and and, and um, enough pen work because he'd call me on the plane flying to a different game, right? So I get a call at 2 a.m. in the morning, and I'm like, where are you? He's like, are we flying to the other game that we got to play, Orlando versus whomever? And he's like, well, I got to kick this for you. So that's how I knew he was focused, and he's kicking the rhyme, and you're hearing all his other teammates like, yo, come on, man. And then, you know, and he's just like, nah, nah, I'm on the phone. Just leave me alone. But he's he's really focused on, you know, what he's doing. So I think that um, I was blessed to be able to introduce, I want to say, the world to like the first real MC slash basketball player. You mm. know what I mean? That actually took it to heart. That like there's no other MC that rhyme, no other basketball player that rhyme with so many other MCs, and that's that's been so respected. You know what I mean? That's the only basketball player that rhyme with Biggie, right? And that's the only basketball player that Biggie wrote for, right? You've had other try to rhyme. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Well, this, this, <laughs> failed miserably. Failed. Yeah, failed. <laughs> and we can say that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like I said, you know, I, I'm uh, listening to you as a t- teenager and, yeah. uh, you know, you hear nothing but hit plus hit plus hit. Uh, and then trying to figure out what happened after, this, you know, you guys dropped two albums and then Greatest Hits album. Mm-hmm. Uh what ha- what happened to the group after the greatest hits album dropped? After the greatest hits album dropped, see, all right, so everybody stop waving at me. All right, so, <laughs> all right. Okay, so after the the greatest hits album dropped, <clears throat> before the greatest hits album dropped, I think that um everything that works for Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince will not work for every other artist on that label. They had a, a um a certain crossover appeal that we didn't have. Mm. You know, at the time, Will was doing, um, you know, he's doing television and movies and all this stuff. So, of course, his fan base is going to be crazy. But what you tried for Will can't work for the Fushnikins or any other act. So, for me, I got to the point where um, Nervous Breakdown was one of the most creative albums for me because I had to to really sit there there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff and no one really spoke about, but there was a lot of work put into that album. That album was supposed to be a solo album, hmm. supposed to be my solo album. But I, I figured at that time we didn't, we didn't peak the way in which we were supposed to. So coming off of what's up doc to do a solo album would have been perfect for me. But you know, living purpose at the time coming off of what's up doc and doing a second album made so much sense so you're peeking with what's up doc and everybody's going crazy and then we drop breakdown and that just murdered everything where everybody was like where are these guys really from because that really um showed the creative side of the group now no one is really trying to say that they're you know the fushnikins are from east flatbush brooklyn when you do a record like breakdown Mm -hmm sound like a total west coast record or midwest but they're just like well these guys did a record like this and it worked so now everybody's like well we can't be pigeonholed to a sound you can't be pigeonholed to the new york sound because these guys are not pigeonholed to anything they 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 dropped a reggae song they dropped a straight up hip-hop song with 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 tribe they just dropped a a, um a, a midwest song you know with with um eric sermon and it, it, it put us in position to do what we wanted to do at the time. And I think at that point in time, Jive was like, you know, wh- what do we do with them now? And for me, when you get to that point, it's time to get, it, it, it's kind of scary because I'm, I'm not doing anything out of the, out of the norm for me. Right. You know, I'm not wearing anything weird. <laughs> I'm not, you know, pairing up with MCs that you would, you would most likely hear me, most likely hear me pair up with. I'm not doing that. So, I rather bow out gracefully, and I think that um, I started recording a couple of songs at the time, and then I stopped. You know, I stopped right after that, and um, 
those songs they used for the greatest hits, which was original Root Boy and some of the stuff like that. And the response was crazy all around the world about doing a reggae album. <clears throat> I just never done one. But other than that, um, that's how the greatest hits um, started. And that's how we actually got out of our contract with Jive. It was actually just giving them those records. It's a three contract, three, yeah, three album, three album. Go, done. done. Got that. So when did you start? I mean, you mentioned uh, Nervous Breakdown being the solo album. But when did you start thinking solo? Or why why did you start thinking solo? I wasn't thinking solo. Jive was thinking solo. For you? Yes, because everybody was like, because they started seeing everybody mimic. And they started seeing certain groups mimicked after the Fushnickens. You had one guy that could do a little reggae, and you had one guy that, you know, two other guys, and there's, right. there's a ton of groups that I could mention, <laughs> you know, with that whole situation. But um, I always wanted to do a solo album, you know, because there's there's so many dimensions to myself that no one knows. But and but then when people hear certain records, they're like, well, why, you, why haven't you done a solo album? I haven't done a solo album back then because I was more so thinking of, the group in the history, mm. you know, so that's over now. The group did what it did, history. Now it's time for other things, and, and, and that will be shown pretty soon. So, so you know, as I'm researching for our interview, uh -huh. you know, you, I obviously type in Chip Fu, mm -hmm. uh, Google does does its thing, mm -hmm. and then I come around solo tracks, and I mentioned this in the intro, but then I also find a, 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 a Jungle Rock Jr., Mm -hmm. So who is Jungle Rock Jr.? And how did you come up with that name? Jungle Rock Jr., jungle meaning the sound. I mean, I'm junior to the sound. Basically, everything was created in the jungle. You could actually sit in the jungle and just close your eyes and listen, and you will hear every sound known to man. Because when you look at keyboards, right, the old keyboards back in the days that had sound in them, they'd say where the sound came from, oh, yeah. right? <laughs> Remember the symbols from, <laughs> from Australia, <laughs> you know, rocks, <laughs> right, rocks being clapped together in the, in the Everglades. Oh my God, we're, we're really dating ourselves. Walkmans <laughs> you know, and, exactly. and synthesizers. So I'm sitting there going, all right, the whole Jungle Rock Junior side was just <clears throat> a different moniker for myself. So, you know, whenever I put out reggae music, I just put it out under that moniker. And there's times where you know, promoters would book me, didn't know who they were booking. They were booking Jungle Rock Jr. And he's actually filling out stadiums and theaters with records that's just floating under the radar. And then when I go there, they're like, you know, you look like Chip Fu. And I'm like, dude. And they're like, you, you got to be kidding me. I'm like, no. <laughs> I'm doing festivals with Shaggy and, and all these dudes. I'm not the dude that's walking out there with the band. I'm mm. walking out there with, with, I'm still keeping it hip hop. I'm walking out there with my DJ and I'm just like, yo, throw on these beats and we just could do whatever. But that was just, <clears throat> the whole Jungle Rock Jr. was just for me to be able to release certain things so people could hear the other side and be prepared for, you know, what's to come. Mm. All right? uh, your track, uh, the video for your track, uh, mm. Put Your Paint On. Put on uh, your paint, yeah. Yeah, uh, it starts uh, with words on the screen, kind of a black background, and mm -hmm. one word kind of sentence that stood out to me was, quote, never dumbed down or changed for anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, what is that a reference to? Do you think it is a reference to hip-hop music, and or is it a reference to reggae music as well, but uh, who's dumbing down and who's changing? The world is acting, to me, the world is acting like they need to dumb down. But everything is moving so fast. So there's no need to dumb down when everything is moving fast. If everything was moving slow, then you dumb down. But the age that you're in, the age that we're in, there's no reason to dumb down. You understand what I'm saying? And I said that because a lot of people um, started getting afraid of lyricists. Like, oh, he can really rhyme. I don't want to hear him. He, he, like, he took his time with his penmanship. <laughs> no, I, don't, I don't want to deal. You're, you're, you're saying so many words. I don't want to deal with you. You know what I'm saying? And for me, I was like, no, that, that's part of the art form. You know, for a person to sit there at their, their kitchen table, because I still do that, sit at the kitchen table and write. And you put time and energy to what you write. And, it's in, and people get it. I think when they get it, it makes more sense. You know what I mean? So when I did that record, I did it to show 
that there was no dumb down in for me. Mm-hmm. You know, I was able to come from a reggae record and step in, you know, through the, the picture frame and walk right into a hip hop record. So I'm, I'm not going to change a dumb down for anybody. And there's a record we have called Dumbfounded. Yeah, that that states mm-hmm. yeah, why I won't dumb down for anybody. Yeah. I want to I want to get more in your the, the fact that you're able to switch from hip hop to mm-hmm. reggae mm-hmm. is extremely fascinating to me because Thank you. Uh, especially because I can't write a rhyme to save my life. Right. And uh, but it's also like it's, a, it's amazing because there's something cr- creatively you have to have two different switches in order I imagine to <clears throat> do that. So a couple of questions is how is the writing process different? for you are the same writing reggae versus hip hop. And then also has there been moments where you have an idea for a hip hop record and realize that it only works better as a reggae record or vice versa? Ring the alarm was that record. Really? Yes. I was rhyming on a record, killing it lyrically. And, um, it didn't make any sense to me because it, what I was doing was not, it didn't match the chorus. And the weird thing was the guy, Tennisaw, who we sampled, actually came down and was staying across the street from me in Brooklyn in a basement apartment that he rented out. And I actually sampled his record because he was there. And um, I went back. The original track was um, Going Way Back by um, Just Ice. That was the Mm -hmm. drum track for Ring the Alarm before it changed. So I wrote it with the intent to just kill it with just rhymes, but then I was like, no, let me let me go back. And then that's what came out, ring the alarm. I don't want to say more about what, you know, ringing the alarm, right. just letting people know that we're here. I think the writing process for me when doing reggae records is more emotional because that's 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 me. That's 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 the island side of me, you know. When I when I think about that, I I you know, I I resonate more with family when doing reggae records because of what used to go on in the household. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And if there's a certain line that I say that everybody can remember, they're like, I remember that line. You know what I, mean? I think rhyming for me is the crossword puzzle. One of the, the the most incredible crossword puzzles you could ever do. And I don't think anybody could do a crossword puzzle like me. You know what I mean? When it comes to, to me and my cadence and how I put songs together. You can't do it. You know what I mean? So, so to be able to balance the both of them i think that um some people say gift and curse i just want to just say that it's it's the gift because i could never get tired of writing and i don't get writer's block mm. because i could borrow from anyone all right you know if i'm stuck here i'm like let me write it and say it this way or you know i never you know, and i shall never get writer's block you know what i mean but i think that um <clears throat> the one person who brought that to my attention was jamal ski and i have to give him props um uh it was a um, man, Wetlands, an old club in the village called Wetlands. Yeah. Um, they had a competition there, and Jamal Ski was there. And Jamal Ski was like, um, well, listen, here's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to do one competition for hip-hop and one competition for reggae. And I was the only person assigned for both. So he was like, what are you doing? I was like, yo, I want to do both. So he was like, all right. So I went on the hip-hop side, destroyed it. So then oh, I'm going on the other side um, for the reggae. And they threw on a reggae beat and I started singing. And it was like, this is odd. And then Jamalski came, comes out and, and cuts it off and was like, yo, you're the first person I met that could do something like this. He was like, you know, you got to understand you have a gift. <clears throat> and in every club I did that. Mm-hmm. And I started gaining, you know, uh, momentum behind the fact that yo, you could throw on anything, and this kid is gonna—he's he, gonna rip it. You know what I mean? So that's how that worked out for me. And I love the fact that I, I can, I can hear a regular beat, and hear reggae elements in the reg, in, in a regular hip hop beat that no one would hear. So that, so when I write something like that to that beat, they're like, yeah, I, I wouldn't have heard that. On you're right. Track. I didn't hear those elements in there. I'm like, well, you're not listening. You're not hearing what I'm hearing. You get what I'm saying? So. I want to turn to uh, May 27, 1994. <clears throat> okay. uh, Nickens takes part in a huge performance, the last Arsenio Hall show. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, MC Light's there, Naughty by Nature, Wu-Tang, Das Effects, Tribe. Um, 
what was that performance like? But also for some, for people that don't really understand, uh, I think the importance of Arsenio Hall was the hip hop. Mm-hmm. Can we? Can you talk about that a little bit? Hip hop never was on television because everybody was afraid of the messages that hip hop would give. Even if you had a positive song, people were just like, you cannot put that on late night television. Late night TV was supposed to be for uh, middle aged people that came home after working, you know, a hard day's work and would just open a can of beer and sit down and watch some late night television. And that's what it was supposed to be about questions and answers with their favorite uh, actors or whatever. Arsenio was like, listen, you know, I was brought up in hip hop. I'm going to turn this into what I want to turn it into. So every artist, whether it be rock and roll, punk, reggae, um, hip hop, he had it on his show. Whether you're controversial or not, he had you on his show. And um, I think... If it wasn't for Arsenio, you, you, wouldn't have, you wouldn't have known about a lot of artists. I think everybody ran home mm-hmm. to watch Arsenio to see what other artists he would have. You know what I mean? And you, you're seeing reggae on, on Arsenio. It's like, yo, he, <laughs> you're seeing Mad Cobra on Arsenio <laughs> like, wow. You know, I, I would have never thought Mad, you know, Arsenio would book Mad Cobra, but he booked Mad Cobra. And he booked Shaba Ranks and... and, and um, all these other people, you know what I mean? So that's that was the importance of Arsenio Hall. So to hear that they were canceling his show, it struck a nerve with the commun- with the hip hop community because it was like, you know, that was the platform mm-hmm. where now you had all the record companies going. Well, where are they going to go now? Like, where you know how can who are we going to pitch our artists to now? So <clears throat> I think that was the weirdest meeting in the history of hip hop because you have a room filled with everybody. Nobody's talking to each other yet. I remember coming out of my hotel room and you see, I'm seeing everybody and their mama, but no one is talking because everybody was in that headspace like, yo, this is the last performance on us in the hall. Mm. So we went into a practice space. They had this huge practice space for us. And I walked in and, you know, you got Wu-Tang over here. You got <laughs> Naughty by Nature over here. And, and um, it was real quiet. And then you see Pete Rock over there. And as soon as he pressed play, everybody started looking at each other. And we put the show together. And it was everybody left the egos at the door about mm. who's going to go first, who's going to go second. We put that whole show together. And that was all practice. How much practice? All practice. How you saw it yeah. is how we practiced it. And how it came out is how we expected it to come out. The only thing that we didn't practice was the Mad Lion part, which was one of the most incredible parts in it because, you know, Karis one came out and freestyled his verse mm-hmm. and then brought Mad Lion out to top everything off, which made it even, which, which took it to another place. You know what I mean? So... I think that was one of the most creative days in hip hop because you could have had MCs arguing, nah, let me go first. Like, yo, your record ain't even really moving. All that could have been yeah. said. That was all left at the door. And it was more so about um being a part of history. Like, I don't even think there'll be anything as historical as that event. Right. And I think that someone needs to do a documentary about that event because there's so many, there's so many stories that could be told about that day because of all the groups that were there. Right. First and foremost, there's a lot of, there's a lot of people that's no longer with us. You have old dirty bastard, you have guru and you have five. They're no longer here with us. Everybody else is still here. So there's so many stories from so many parts that people could talk about, about that um, last Arsenio Hall show. I remember sitting down and half of the artists filled up the entire front row, the entire front bleachers at the show. There was that many artists there. There was so many artists there that didn't even get on the song, but was just there just to show, um, you know, their respects. Did, 
was the appreciation, do you think the appreciation for what was happening, was it, do you think it was immediate or? Oh, it was super immediate because people kept talking about that show. And when Arsenio Hall came back to late night TV, everybody was petitioning for him to do, to, to start the show with everybody that did that right. performance for him. Like, yo, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start my show like this. Right. And bring everybody back. And it, it would have made so much sense to start it like that and then talk about who's here and who's not here. You know what I mean? But I, that, that was a great day for hip hop. A great day for hip hop great day because it you know and to be a part of that it just lets me know how much of an impact you know we had when it came to the culture at that time because he was like yeah, i only want the hottest people and he spoke to queen latifah and was like i want the push i want so and so <clears throat> and just to be on that lineup and then you're seeing the list and i'm like and then you have to pick one person from your group right i was the only person that rhymed from my group. So 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 for me, that was like, yo, you put a stamp on the culture and and that that was, you know, that's history. That's history in the making right there. That's it. Uh you mentioned music that you're gonna that sounds like you have music in the works. Uh why do you why do you keep what what keeps you going? What keeps you uh wanting to be a part of the culture, wanting to rhyme, wanting to do reggae? What keeps me of the culture for me it's the fact that I don't think that people have heard everything yet it's the fact that I don't think there's there's, there's so many things that can be said and done that no one even thought about doing yet and I think for me how I think I think I can do all those things and that's why I continuously record and even when it comes to the reggae side, I'm like, well, you guys really don't even know yet. You know, and even when I sit amongst my friends, new friends, they, my old friends would tell my new friends, dude, you don't even really know, you know, the type of stuff that this guy can do because of, of how I move. But um, I think nowadays it's a difference because, you know, now I'm not afraid to showcase certain when it comes to music and the music is coming quick, you know what I mean? And it's, it's, I had a nice hiatus, you know, after my mom passed, you know, and it, it put me in a different headspace, man, uh, a different headspace. But to finally be out of that headspace and I finally got to the point where you got to stop thinking about her passing and her pain and think about her peace, mm. which makes more sense to me. Yeah. So now that she's at peace, I just need to just destroy everything. You know what I mean? And just live out her legacy. Like, all right, you took that plane over here to make sure we were all right. So now that I'm in this position, let me, let me really just show these people what I'm about when it comes to music. You know what I mean? Like, that I'm one of the dudes that no one should ever in their right mind count out. Not me. I, I've always thought that way from young. Don't ever count me out of certain things. I don't care how much rhyme. I don't care how much people respect you on whatever rhyme level that's one thing i, I don't I, I don't i don't ever want anybody to do and that's not coming from a, um i'm a better i'm better than you and da, 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 type thing that's that's never been me right. you know what i mean but that's that's how i move with me when it comes to, to, to i take my craft very serious and i don't ever want a person to feel that when it comes to anything lyrically don't 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 contest me with nothing like that mm -mm. it ain't gonna be a good day for nobody but if we if it's just about music and continuously putting out music, I think that um, as an artist coming up, you they they look for the, that their muse or whatever, and I always want to be that positive image, image when moving forward. And you know, there's artists that come up to me and be like, "Yo, man, I learned this from you, this and that, yeah, and it's a beautiful thing." That's how I was raised. But that whole other side, nah, leave that alone. <laughs> Please leave that alone. I, I stand by that. Please leave that alone. Uh, I know we've been here for a while, so I, I want to end with this. Um, you've done a lot, obviously. You've mm -hmm. written a lot. Is there a, not just a lyric from hip-hop, but also mm -hmm. a lyric from reggae that kind of stands out to you that kind of reinforces the fact that you're really good at what you do? Lyrical concoctions, 
lyrical concoctions atop of concoctum. Competitors atop the top them, a stand on top them, a one foot on top them. That says so much to me. You know? <laughs> never ponder a pun, never ponder a pun when I'm punning, never ponder a pun when I'm punning, like big pun, I'm a punish it numb. No one else is doing that. No one else is sitting down there understanding how to to dissect words into pieces like that. So for me, there's thousands of those things that I have in my books that I know that if it's said, it it'll it'll make people really think about going back to their penmanship or, or you know or their pen mm. game. Like people don't think like that. Anytime I dumb down at my level, the dumb down will leave you dumbfounded. Come on, <laughs> they're not thinking like they're thinking like. But me, I'm sitting there saying, once I say this. Mm -hmm. I don't care where I'm at when I say anything that I'm writing. Once I say it, it has to put you in position to be like, yo, I didn't think about that. I don't want to say something and it was already said. Right. That's bothersome to me. Like when I hear certain lines that other people, da, 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 like so and so, I'm like, everybody heard that already. Right. I want that when I say what I say, you're stuck. Like, yo, I, I didn't even think about putting those words. So for me, so for me, those type of lines will always be endless when it comes to lyrics for me, because that's 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 something I don't play with. I got a song called "Lyrics" is my hobby and favorite subject. That when that comes, yeah, that's gonna be. I just can't wait for the new material. That's all I'm saying. I'm, I'm, I'm ended on that. Yeah. It's funny when uh, I I got to see the UMTV raps uh, mm -hmm. at the Barclays and uh, when you came on mm -hmm. and rhymed, I. Made it. I was like, I gotta reach out to him and try to get an interview with him. Okay. And kind of was blown away. I mean, because I, I never got to see you guys live. So right. I was just like, wow, he's still doing this mm -hmm. and he's better than most people out there. You know, like, I mean, it was this thing. And, and the reaction from the crowd was mm -hmm. incredible to watch. Right. Uh, I had the upper cheap receipts. So I, was, I, I think for me, um, that did, that showed it a lot for me. One is it, it, um, it was the ending and the beginning, meaning the ending of un the ending of old mm -hmm. and the beginning of new for me at that point in time. And just watching the crowd, the reaction and everything, it 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 just it made me understand it's you. And I was just like, all right, cool. I I, I took that from that show. That's awesome. That's great. You know what I'm saying I took that from that show. Like it's you. I don't care where we put you or whatever, and you didn't even have enough time, but it's you. And I was just like, you know, thank God for that. And I was I was super appreciative of of having the opportunity. Mm. Now behind the scenes, everybody didn't know what was going on, but my thing is is understand. <laughs> 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 like I put that in there. <laughs> was actually understanding because you, you, it's more so it's the domino effect. You have to always say to yourself, what did you get out of the situation? And when I got out of that situation was it's you that's what i got out of that situation yeah mm. that's it uh legendary chip foo uh yeah, it's, it's, it's been legendary that's 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 dope i still got some more legendary yeah. things to do i'm very super excited for the new stuff that's coming out yes. uh it's a it's a great honor to have you on the show no, thank you for having me uh, i don't normally do interviews <laughs> and i wanted to do this interview I appreciate yeah, that. I don't know. I've seen what you're doing, you know, for the culture. And I was just like, nah, that's that's one interview I'm going to do. Thank you so much, man. Nah, thank you. Thank you for being on the show. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Thanks for man. having me.